James Cameron is on the cusp of redefining and changing cinema forever. Again, let's see if Hollywood dares to follow suit. Hi everyone, let's take a comprehensive, holistic and high frame rate look at Avatar The Way of Water. The marketing material for Way of Water is selling this as the experience of a generation, and while that may sound like pure marketing, there is a surprising amount of ironic truth behind that. To properly review this movie and contextualize what it means for the future of cinema, I also have to highlight some of the choices that brought us to where we are now. This is going to be a long and at parts technical video. If you don't care about all of those elements and just want a review of the movie, I've also added chapters to this video, so you can just go ahead and jump to that. But if you care about movies, you should definitely watch this video in its entirety. With that out of the way, let's nerd out about this one. Outstanding. The most important thing right from the get-go, with this movie it makes a massive difference which version and in what kind of venue you watch it. Definitely watch it in 3D, as that's how it's meant to be experienced. But if you can, go and watch it in a Dolby Cinema, and if that doesn't work, try to find a laser IMAX showing, as both will project the movie in 3D and at a high frame rate. And mentioning that, I will split this video up into the following chapters. Why are movies shot at 24 FPS to begin with? And no, contrary to what many people out there are saying, it's not because it's cinematic or filmic. There are a few reasons for it, none of which have anything to do with the artistic aspects of movie making. Followed by some of the technical aspects of how the movie was shot. Then I look at the movie itself and end it with what it means for the future of cinema and movies in general. So let's dive into this cinematic 24 FPS myth. There are quite a few videos out there focusing on the topic of frame rates in cinema, and I will link two very good ones in the description below. But right now, I will get straight to the point. Back when motion pictures were still in their infancy more than a hundred years ago, people experimented with the concept of motion and concluded that a string of 12 images per second is blended together by the brain to create the illusion of motion. When people started to project the movies, though, they realized quickly that the amount of white flicker created by the projection hindered that experience. It was found that from 46 images per second onwards, the way the persistence of our vision perceives motion essentially eliminates this flickering issue. This meant that to enjoy movies properly, they had to be projected 46 images per second or higher. To achieve that, movies in the silent era were shot at around 16 frames per second, and each frame was shown three consecutive times with a so-called three-bladed shutter, for a total of 48 frames per second, to create a minimum level of visual screen persistence. Almost a century ago, around 1929, audio entered the cinema landscape and movie makers decided to transition away from silent films and add sound to the cinematic experience. To do that, they added the audio onto the film strip itself. The problem was that the audio needed to synchronize with the 16 FPS film footage and the corresponding 16 Hz audio sampling rate required to match it wasn't of a high enough quality. So they decided to jump to the next best frame rate, which for editing reasons had to be divisible by 2, 3 and 4 and could also be multiplied to a projection rate of 46 images or above. And the first frame rate that worked at was 24 FPS, which could easily be doubled to the projected 48 images per second. And they decided not to go higher even though it would have improved the visual perception further because film was very expensive as a recording intermediate. As you can see, 24 frames per second were chosen for purely functional, technological and economic reasons due to limitations we had almost 100 years ago and not due to its cinematic attributes. And even then, its technical shortcomings, and those aren't all, were so obvious that movie makers had to engineer around them to make it work properly. So for everyone insisting on the 24 FPS experience, you've never had it. You've always had at least 48 Hz, but probably 50 or 60. And that's what brings us to the final issue, which makes 24 FPS problematic to this day, which is that the vast majority of displays out there, no matter whether it's TVs, monitors or smartphones, wanted a 60 Hz refresh, which makes a proper delivery of 24 FPS problematic, as 24 images can't be evenly divided with a 60 Hz refresh. And yes, there are ways around this by using pull downs, and some people are lucky enough to have 120 Hz panels, or even some that support refresh rates like 48 or 96 Hz. But even those don't completely solve the issue, and what's worse is that all of these feats of engineering are solutions to a problem that is 100 years old and we solved decades ago. Which is why directors such as Douglas Trumbull, Ang Lee, Peter Jackson, and James Cameron are doing their best to transition away from it. The only thing that makes 24 FPS cinematic 
is that we've grown accustomed to experiencing it over the last century. And this brings us to the next chapter, how the way of water was brought to life. James Cameron's primary focus has always been to bring the audience as close as possible to experiencing the worlds he's created. To do that, he has been on a relentless journey to identify all factors that contribute to an absolute immersion and deliver those with absolute perfection. And The Way of Water is the pinnacle of that endeavor, for which he laid the groundwork with the first Avatar movie by defining three of the four key factors necessary for it. Firstly, in order to properly stimulate the brain, the image has to be presented in the native stereoscopic fashion in which the human brain perceives the world, 3D. Secondly, all occurring movement has to be captured and presented with the same fidelity as we see in real life, so every bit of movement in the frame and not just the performances must be motion captured. Thirdly, the compositing and matching of digital and photographed assets must be perfect, as even the slightest mismatch will destroy the immersion. And Cameron managed all of those perfectly in the first movie. And the fourth and last one, which I'm personally a massive fan of, if done right, is the frequency with which the human eye perceives the world, high frame rate. So James Cameron decided to shoot certain scenes, but unfortunately not all of them, at twice the frame rate, 48 instead of 24, to improve the level of fluidity in shots with the complexity, the 3D or the fluidity required it. But that means that more dramatic or narrative shots like dialogue are shot at the standard 24 FPS. And this is where the first big issue comes in. The difference in fluidity and clarity between these two frame rates is drastic at times, especially when you jump from the dramatic 24 FPS scene without much movement to a more hectic one at 48 with a lot of it. The difference can be incredibly stark, especially closer to the end of the movie, where you have prolonged parts at high frame rate followed by short dramatic ones where the jump in fluidity can be so intense that it tears you out of the experience. So much so that we had a few people in the cinema asking if the projection was broken because certain scenes seemed like they were lagging and stuttering. Just like in the IMAX re-release of the first one a few months ago, I found the lack of consistency in the visual fluidity, especially the jump between them, very jarring and quite distracting, just like with shift in aspect ratios as well. With all due respect to the directors, but I absolutely can't understand why you would deliberately tinker with the visual consistency of the image. I really hope you don't see it, but for those of you that have already watched it, please let me know in the comments if you watched it at a high frame rate and whether or not you found it distracting at times. I'm very curious to know. And according to Peter Jackson, shooting a movie at 48 instead of 24 FPS only increases the budget by roughly 20% and doesn't double it as the increase in frames might imply. And considering the length of these movies and the general budget they have, especially as 2 and 3 will total a runtime of roughly 6 hours, I wouldn't be surprised if that played a role in this approach as well, as there were quite a few scenes that would have definitely benefited from the high frame rates that didn't have them. I know James Cameron can get very high budget for his movies, but even he has limits, and I believe this may very well have been one of them, as I would honestly be shocked if he wouldn't have wanted to do more at a high frame rate as well. But even with all that, it's definitely a step up from the standard frame rate presentation. But enough of high frame rates, as for all the other technical aspects, they're flawless. The rendering quality is impeccable, and except for a few materials that looked slightly off, and two shots where the animation didn't look perfect, Everything else is just that, perfect. The rendering of the skin, eyes, and hair is meticulous. The animation of the nuanced facial movement is a step above everything else out there. The only movie that can match it is the rendering of a young Will Smith and Gemini Man, which was also done by Weta at a high frame rate. But what blows everything else out of the water is the rendering of the water itself. I know, bad pun, but I had to do it. sound like as i mentioned in my trailer analysis the water rendering is one of the if not the hardest things to get right because not only do you have to get the visual aspects right like reflections refractions caustics etc but you also have to handle its movement correctly and it's not just the way the water moves on the surface and the waves that are created but also its velocity and kinetic energy and the impact it has on all elements on the water and the effect all of those elements have on it. And I'm not only talking about flora and fauna down there, but also about trapped and exhausted air, as well as propelled water created by the movement from people, 
creatures, machinery, and the waves. The simulations of all these things alone must have been ridiculously exhaustive, and that's before we get to the topic of calculating the effect water has on the light penetrating it, and the way it's scattered and diffracted before it hits the subject, and it's shocking how real it looks and behaves, mainly because due to us coming into contact with water every day, we know its properties and behavior perfectly well, and it still looks perfect. There are VFX companies that have dedicated and specialized themselves to the rendering of water alone, and nothing has come even close to this level of fidelity. And the thing that cements all of this is the amount of care that was put into making the underwater movement of the characters look real by actually motion capturing them underwater. They built a 900,000 gallon tank that could mimic the ocean's kinetics, develop special underwater motion capture suits, modify the infrared sensors used to capture the data of their movement to work in water, and then occluded the entire surface of the water tank with diffuse white plastic balls to eliminate the light frequencies that would interfere with their motion capture. And while they were doing all that, the cast learned how to free dive and hold their breath for between 5 to 7 minutes so they could perform all of the underwater scenes without a mask to create a realistic motion and performance capture for those scenes. Up to 7 minutes! Out of curiosity, I timed myself, I got to 73 seconds, and I almost passed out. They also built a new 3D camera setup based on Sony's latest full-frame cinema camera, the Sony Venice, and its Rialto system, which was able to shoot up to 6K resolution while also being able to detach its sensor block from the processing unit. These two camera elements are then tethered together over a distance of up to 20 feet, which meant that the actual camera could be carried by an assistant while the camera operator was free to handle the comparatively small and lightweight stereoscopic 3D rig. This camera system was also adapted to work with the submersible 3D beam splitter system created by Pavel Achtel called Deepex 3D that instead of using lens housings for the underwater scenes, which reduces the amount of capturable resolution to roughly 2K, while also introducing visual degradations like chromatic aberration and distortion, made it possible to use submersible 15mm Nikonos lenses, which allowed them to shoot accurate and visually flawless high resolution and high dynamic range footage. And it pays off. The level of voluminosity created by its 3D is incredible and pretty much perfect. I couldn't see any ghosting, improper depth layering, or other issues. Admittingly, I watched it in Adobe Cinema and literally had the best seat in the house, sitting dead center in the middle but it goes to show how good the movie can look under the proper circumstances, and that any issues you encounter with its visuals are probably caused by the projector and not the movie itself. And this is where I'm going to stop talking about the technical aspects of the movie, because I have 3,000 words of additional notes about this topic, and I assume the vast majority of people that started watching this video never made it to this point. So thank you for sticking around so we can look at the movie itself now, starting with the story. Why do you come to us? I just want to keep my family safe. Releasing a sequel 13 years after the original introduces the issue that not only have the audiences and times changed, but many of them have probably forgotten what the first movie was about to begin with. And I'm happy to tell you that The Way of Water doesn't use a cheap flashback to retell you what happened, but instead continues the journey where it ended in the original by introducing you to everything that has changed since then. Jake and Eteri have not only continued to lead the Omotikaias or Luek Tan, but have also built up a family of their own. Unfortunately for them, the RDA responsible for the calamity in the original has returned to Pandora with an army that isn't only meant to fight and eliminate Toruk Makto, but also prepare Pandora for a full-on takeover, as Earth is on the brink of collapse and a new home is needed. This sets into motion the story for all four movies to come, with a way of water focusing exclusively on the Sully family dynamic and the impact they have on the world around them, while also interweaving a few of the story elements from the original to refresh the audience on the happenings of the first one, while also creating a path forwards. And this is where, just like the predecessor, the issue of identity comes in. Just like the first movie, Way of Water doesn't have a very complicated or original story, because, just like the original, this movie is conceived as a world-building experience and set up for the movies to come. And it's very obvious that Cameron and his priorities have also changed in these 13 years. Whatever plans Cameron may have had for this franchise when he wrote the first one, watching this movie makes it pretty obvious that while the essential foundation for it is probably still the same, certain aspects of it have changed so much that this movie is essentially a relaunch of the franchise 
with more but different but also the same characters. In short, The Way of Water seems more like a narrative course correction than an actual sequel, which almost feels like Cameron is trying to abandon many aspects and the world of the original as quickly as possible, to focus on this new one which is required to continue the story the way Cameron now wants it to. The thing that makes this problematic is that this course correction, split up into multiple movies and set up for the upcoming sequels, turns Way of Water into an incredibly passive and reactive movie that only shows things happening to the characters instead of them actively contributing to the development of the story and the world, as the original one did. Avatar 2 and 3 will end up doing the same thing in two movies that the first one did in one. This isn't the actual sequel we were waiting for, but a stepping stone because that will be the next one. I won't be saying more about this, because I'm sure you'll know what I mean when you watch it, but even with all that said, this may not make much of a difference, because if you love the world and the characters of the original, I'm sure you're going to do the same here. And speaking of characters, the cast does a beautiful job. Zoe Zaldana and Kate Winslet in particular stand out with short but intense, fierce and heartwarming performances as both mothers and leaders. Sam Worthington delivers a more confident performance as an experienced and war-torn Oluek Than, but takes a clear step back as well, as the two main driving forces for the narrative are Stephen Lang's return as Quaritch and Britton Dalton's portrayal as second-born Loak. Lang's take on Quaritch is far more grounded, nuanced, and believable this time around, and Dalt manages to stay on the fine line between youthful, energetic, and optimistic, while also being stubborn, overconfident, and too quick to act. Sigourney Weaver's Kiri is a curious one, but you don't get to see much of it, as it's exclusively meant as a setup for the upcoming movies, and the rest of the cast does an excellent job of supporting the characters and narrative. Outcast, that's all they see. However, one of the two things that I find to be a step down from the first one is the cinematography. While Cameron loves to operate the camera himself, much of the layout, blocking, lighting, planning, and so on is done by the DP, and Mauro Fiore did an incredible job with the first one, creating a semi-voyeuristic cinematic style that made it feel like there isn't a camera, but your point of view follows these people around in 3D. What elevated this to another level, which is something Way of Water lacks completely, was the additional dimension and movement that we're able to explore, because a lot of the movie took place in flight or suspended in mid-air on the Ikrans, helicopters, and the Hallelujah Mountains. While Way of Water has improved visually, it didn't have that many jaw-dropping moments of distinctly different and alien experiences like the first one. The Way of Water feels more confined, less ambitious, but more beautiful, and this can be said about the art design as well, which deviates drastically from the more alien aspects of the first movie. This isn't surprising, as the first movie focused much more on the world itself. This one is more intimately centered on the characters and Cameron's wish to create more awareness for marine conservation. Nevertheless, while spectacular, longtime Cameron collaborator and DP Russell Carpenter has a more documentary-esque approach to his cinematography and doesn't manage to create the original's magical and dynamic moments. And unfortunately, the same thing can also be said for the score. Original composer James Horner sadly passed away in 2015, and the torch was passed on to Simon Franklin. Horner's soundtrack was tribal, bombastic, emotional, epic, and unique, and Avatar's themed pieces created a level of intimate spectacle that Franklin's score cannot match. And it becomes incredibly obvious in those moments when they decide to reuse Horner's pieces for an acoustic and thematical callback to the original. And while those feel comforting and familiar, they also feel somewhat alien and misplaced. The entire score disappeared in the background for me, which is both good and bad. Mighty. So what does all of this mean for the future of cinema? Sadly, nothing. Just like other HFR movies before, The Way of Water has one fundamental visual flaw that doesn't allow it to transcend the shackles of the now century-old 24fps standard. The Hobbit failed due to its mismatch in visual styles between the live action and CG material, which looked off at 24fps already and was amplified even further by the clarity of 48fps, especially for all the keyframe character animations that didn't align with the natural movement we usually perceive and are often referred to as gamey because it looks unnaturally fluent. 
Lulalin and Gemini Man were the other extreme, where Ang Lee's approach to creating naturalistic and documentary style visuals, especially with its lighting, created a hyper realistic presentation that made it lose most of its artistic visual refinements. And it honestly didn't help that Gemini Man wasn't that good of a movie either. I don't want to shoot you! Mind if I shoot you? And with Water is finally the perfect example of properly handled high frame rate, as Cameron is clearly aware of the issues in Jackson's and Lee's movies and avoids all of them, but then goes on to ruin it by never giving the audience a chance to get used to it, by changing back and forth regularly. Unfortunately, Way of Water only manages to prove what a stuttering mess 24 FPS is without giving us the time to adapt to the possible solution that is high frame rate. Just once, I would like someone in Hollywood to have the balls to ditch the 24 FPS deliverable altogether and focus exclusively on making a movie at a high frame rate and developing a proper visual language for it, starting with ditching the 180 degree shutter rule, which is useless at frame rates higher than 48, and making a movie at 60 FPS with a 360 degree shutter to get a perfectly crisp and fluent image without losing the motion blur that gels it all together. You know what? F this. I'm tired of waiting for Hollywood. I'll just shoot a short with that setup myself. Make sure to subscribe for that one. The way of water connects all things. Before your birth. And after your death. This is our home! I need you. With me. And I need you to be strong. In conclusion, The Way of Water is not the sequel we were waiting for. While the basic foundation remains the same, this movie, unsurprisingly after more than a decade in the works, feels more like a course correction for the franchise that is meant to steer it into the new direction it's supposed to head towards with the three upcoming sequels. To do that, the movie has to rehash many elements from the original while altering them to fit the new direction. The movie is more of a soft reboot than a sequel, which happens to share much of the original's DNA and characters, while almost completely abandoning others. And it's still designed to be the first part in a series of movies that is meant to set up this entire world. Unfortunately, that makes it a very passive narrative experience. But what you experience is incredible. Cameron has managed to package and visualize his love for the ocean into what can only be described as the most singularly incredible visual experience to have ever hit the silver screen, and a step or two above the original and everything else out there. And while the introduction of a proper high frame rate adaptation is incredible in scenes it's in, the constant back and forth between 24 and 48 FPS can unfortunately make it a jarring experience at times that never really allows you to get used to either one of them. This is a shame as Cameron's attention to detail would have made this a prime example of the improvements in immersion a properly executed high frame rate can be. All in all, the way this movie has been integrated into the larger Avatar franchise turns Way of Water into a fundamentally flawed movie and a stopgap solution. But does that matter? The answer is no. There are no two ways about this. If you care even the slightest bit about good entertainment and escapism, this must be experienced, and in 3D on the largest screen you can find. I'm confident you won't regret it, but until the teaser for the next one comes out, that's it from me for Avatar. Thank you very much for watching and sticking around to the end. It's very much appreciated. Make sure to subscribe for more videos, including a very special one coming shortly. You absolutely must not miss. Consider liking the video if you found it insightful. And if you did, you might enjoy this one as well. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.